Welcome back. I'm Justus. If you kind of missed Neil's introduction, I had the pleasure of working with Kai and Neil on Sequoia, which is a new OpenPGP implementation. And we had the opportunity to start from scratch and, you know, reading the RFC and trying to implement it faithfully. And then we got thinking, uh, what else can we do with OpenPGP and in what kinds of direction can we evolve it? So you can find the slides at this URL, and there are links in the slides if you if you are interested in reading something up. And hopefully we will also put the recordings there. Let's see if that works out. So what is uh, forward secrecy? There is some confusion about the term. Forward secrecy is the um, property that compromise of your long-term key material does not compromise the uh, messages themselves. So if they are recorded by a three-letter agency and then later they get hold of your phone or your computer, they can't decrypt the messages. And the, the term forward secrecy must not be confused with uh, backward secrecy. So forward secrecy protects you from future compromises of your device. Whereas backward secrecy protects you from um, compromise in the past. So backward secrecy, confusingly, is also called future secrecy or post-compromise security. So forward secrecy is implemented in TLS with the ephemeral Diffie-Hellman cipher suits and is known from the instant messaging world um, as a really early version um, in form of the OTR protocol. And then nowadays we have Signal and uh, WhatsApp and Omemo using a new kind of cryptographic primitive to achieve forward secrecy. So how do you achieve forward secrecy? In short, you do uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchanges for every message and then you uh, authenticate the exchange. And one thing to note is that forward secrecy is a property of transport security. So you may know that OpenPGP can also be used to encrypt data at rest. We're not sure if that is uh, widely used, but it can be. So you might want to encrypt your backups or some archive or your a group of journalists collaborating on an article and you have material that you need to protect. So OpenPGP already supports this distinction. There are key flags to mark a key suitable for protecting data at rest or protecting you know, uh, data in motion communications. And I looked at some implementations. At the front you see Sequoia, then GNUPG, Open Keychain, Open, open PGP JS, and then RNP, which is Rebose's uh, fork of NetPGP. I wanted to survey NetPGP because it's used in Delta Chat, and I picked RNP because they have a command line front end, but I didn't realize that RNP um, diverges drastically from NetPGP. But this is what I got. So I looked at whether or not implementations make the distinction whether a key may be used for data addressed or in motion. And none of the existing implementations make this distinction. We do. How? The question is how. So when we want to encrypt something, the user has to specify whether or not, well, whether it's for data addressed or communications and then we pick the appropriate key. What's the default? There's no default. In the, in the lower levels, I don't know okay. if there will be a default in the higher ones. How do you generate keys? Um, well, up to like yesterday, we didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> <coughs> so, in 2001, uh, a group of people around so Mr. Brown came up with the idea how to approximate forward secrecy in OpenPGP. And the idea is quite simple. You generate 
short-term encryption subkeys. And you can generate them in advance, and then you know, implementations can pick the um, appropriate key. And it requires very little changes to existing implementations. So this is, this is the key I generated. At the top, you see the, the primary key. It's the cryptographic identity. And then some user IDs I don't care about. And then there are encryption subkeys, each valid for a week. And you know, there are several parameters you can choose depending on your use case and on your threat model maybe. You can choose how often you want to generate a new key and well, whether, well how, long, how many keys you want to publish in advance. And there are some downsides to the scheme, mainly that all messages within one period of time are encrypted using the same key. And generating keys in advance, you know, presents an opportunity to steal them. On the upside, it's very well supported by existing implementations, and it's way better, better than what we have now. So it's um, supported notably by GNUPG and OpenPG. OpenBGP.js, and Vincent, yesterday or the day before, implemented that in Open Keychain. Thank you. So now we need to talk a little bit about multi-device support, because we feel that OpenPGP lacks a, you know, convincing story for that. Um, as DKG mentioned in a post to the MLS mailing list, it's linked right there, that there are two options. Either you have the same set of keys on every device, or you have per device keys. And there are some trade-offs trade to make. So for the first option, a nice property is that it hides the number of devices as long as you don't leak that in some other kind of fashion. But on the downside, it requires synchronization. And how often it requires synchronization is, well, up to your use case. And then if you have per device keys, um, you can get away with synchronizing only once when you bring a new device online. And it kind of shifts the synchronization problem to your peers. And Daniel thinks that this is a disadvantage because it kind of makes the problem worse. Where, whereas I say it's, it's a bit better because we have the key server net network in place or something like that. Kai started working on a new key server recently. Daniel is also concerned about that, the fact that it increases the size of certificates of keys and it increases complexity. And he strongly prefers the first option, though it's not clear how to implement the uh, synchronization. I know both uh, Autocrypt and PAP use uh, messages injected to the mail store for the setup message. And the problem with that is that it's kind of email specific and OpenPGP in theory is transfer protocol independent. And I'd like to know how that works in practice with the autograph message. We can uh, talk about that later. So a very simple key you can create is one with two <coughs> encryption subkeys. And both are valid for the same um, period of time. And then I created that key and looked at what various implementations do with it. So both Sequoia and Open Keychain encrypt to any um, well, suitable encryption subkey, but all the other implementations just pick the first matching one. But that could be changed easily. So when you say any, you mean both, or what's the correct way to handle this? Um, well, it's it's unclear what's what's the correct way to handle this. So Open Keychain says um, we can't decide that we pick both, and KnuPG says well. I pick the first one. I don't know. This policy just does it differently in every version. <laughs> and also, <laughs> uh, sometimes creation day, it's like preferring CC keys and 
happens. At the end of the day, you can't really be sure. So you think it's best to encrypt to any matching key? Yeah, definitely. Okay. For what do you mean, but not to all of them combined? Yeah. Well, you create one PKESK packet per key. So when we combine multi-device support with forward secrecy, when we want to create uh, short-lived encryption subkeys, suddenly the synchronization problem gets worse. So our, our kind of proposal is to do away with the synchronization and use certification-capable subkeys. And we have one, of, one set of keys per device, one certification-capable subkey, then assigning subkeys uh, and any number of encryption subkeys. And then if we want to create a new device, um, we create a um, certification-capable subkey, create a binding signature using the current device's certification-capable subkey, and then we package that up and, I don't know, format it as QR code and then scan it using our phone and have a simple transfer password, and then the new device has an, a, a new key that is certification capable and is able to create its own set of keys. And it's not clear if this is intended by the RFC, but with some minor clari clarifications and some changes to existing implementations, this kind of scheme could be supported. And none of the existing implementations do that, not surprisingly. One of them seems to pass the test, but that is only a bug in the canonicalization of keys. Did you check? It's only a bug. Yeah, I did. That's interesting. Yeah. So I'd like to walk you through a kind of workflow that we could support with that kind of uh, scheme. We create a key, a certification capable key, that's our primary key, the cryptographic identity. And then we may have an encryption subkey for data at rest and maybe an authentication key. And this set of keys we can put on a smart card and lock away or on an USB stick and lock away. And then we work on to our desktop, our main machine, create a certification-capable subkey, a binding signature using the primary key, and then we can lock it away. And then the desktop can create its own encryption subkeys and signing subkey. Then on the desktop, we want to add a new device or laptop, and we do the same thing. We create a certification-capable subkey, a binding signature, transfer that, and the devices capable of creating its own keys. And then we can do the same for our phone. Now imagine you come back from vacation and you suspect that your home has been compromised, your fridge is gone, um, rotten smell everywhere, and then you're, you suspect that your desktop has been compromised. So you decommission it by revoking its certification capable subkey and then all the binding signatures created using that key are gone. With, with this key, also the laptop and mobile phone keys are gone. Where do I keep the primary key if it's not on my desktop, laptop, or mobile phone? In a safe, in a bank. In the fridge. In the fridge, <laughs> right. But... but <laughs> but you can take your primary key from the safe, from the fridge, and create a new binding signature for the laptop certification capable key. And as soon that, as this is valid again, all the subkeys are valid again too. And then using your laptop, you can create a new binding signature for your phone's certification capable key, and those are good as well. And you can create a new, uh, a nice user interface for that, right? It just asks. Do you want to keep using your phone? And you say yes, and then it creates the necessary binding signatures. So, yeah. Existing messages uh, sharing between the 
devices, I mean, which are the, the encryption is the communication key is expired since the local storage, local messages are stored and encrypted only with the long term key. Or, but now, if I open the account with another a new right. device, would it be able to decrypt the existing messages? Well, not out of the box. And we can discuss that later because users have the expectation to be able to read past mails, right? Mm. So we have to deal with that somehow. Or maybe not. Maybe Delta Chat doesn't have to do that. Maybe you can say, past conversations, I don't care. <laughs> so for now, we have only been approximating forward secrecy. Mm. Since we are good, doing good on the time, we can discuss how to do that uh, using the double ratchet protocol as implemented by, by Signal and WhatsApp and Omemo. So you can read about the double ratchet mechanism, mechanism here. It's a good read. And the double ratchet consists of a Diffie-Hellman ratchet in the middle, and then there is a hash ratchet um, that we use to derive session keys from. And then we have a sending chain on the left and a receiving chain on the right. And my communication partner has both of these keys in reverse, right? So we have this hash ratchet because we want to be, be able to send two messages in a row without our partner replying. And then Whenever we see a new um, Diffie-Hellman public key from our partner, we uh, do a Diffie-Hellman ratchet step, and every time we want to uh, send a new message, we do a hash ratchet step. So Signal, well, I'm not, I'm not sure about Signal, but Omemo uses per device keys, and I think Signal does as well. And there is uh, one pair of double ratchets per device pair that, that is kind of communicating, right? You want to be able to read your uh, messages on the other device, and then you need to have a double ratchet session with your own device. And one of the downsides of uh, this protocol as impl implemented in Omemo, and I assume Signal, is that it uses a centralized server for uh, the setup. And what Omemo does is it generates a set of keys and then it publishes them. And then the, if, you, if someone wants to communicate with you, the initiator of the session picks a key at random and then starts the session. However, someone else might have picked that number, that key, and then you have to have this, uh, you lost the race and you have to deal with that and, and there is this algorithm how to do that. And our idea how to do that in OpenPGP, um, because we don't, don't want to have a centralized server and we don't want like an additional protocol is we ditch uh, the first message because we have already an uh, encrypted secure channel. Uh, we say we send an uh, normal OpenPGP message, and we put our um, double ratchet initialization stuff in the signature as a notation data. And there are two problems how to deal with, uh, we need to deal with. Um, first, uh, well, it has to do with the multi-device support, right? So if I want to initiate a session and then I need to initiate a session with my other devices as well. And how do I do that if I don't know the Diffie-Hellman public keys for that device? Our idea is that the initiating device creates all these keys and sends them to the communication peer. And then that peer reflects the keys back to us. So let's look at an example how that might look like. The setting is as follows. We have Alice who wants to communicate with Bob 
And Alice has two devices, a laptop and a phone, and Bob has a desktop. Um, they need to initialize the algorithm. And Alice's devices are in pink. And um, these are the Diffie-Hellman parameters. And well, the, the private keys, actually. And in pink are the Diffie-Hellman parameters that the initiating device, the laptop, has to generate. So Alice's device, the laptop, generates four Diffie-Hellman keys. And then I marked as green, this is green, uh, the, that the device has either generated or learned of its private keys. And then Alice, is compo Alice composes a traditional message, and the signature contains a double ratchet initialization message. And this message contains, well, all the public keys that uh, Bob needs for his ratchets. And then it also contains the private um, keys that Alice's laptop has generated for Alice's phone. And it's encrypted using the per-device encryption keys of her phone. And then Bob generates its, his keys. And now his device knows the private uh, keys because he generated it. And then the first ratchet is actually initialized on both sides. And then he replies. And in his message, instead of um, using an PKESK, public key encrypted session key, he actually includes a double ratchet encrypted session key. And it contains first his own Diffie-Hellman parameters, the public ones. And then he reflects back the encrypted keys for Alice's phone. And then, obviously, the, the message could, contains the encrypted session key. And it's encrypted using the key generated by the um, double ratchet. And then, as soon as Alice's um, laptop, see, I'm sorry, Alice's phone sees the message, it can decrypt the Diffie-Hellman private keys. And now every device has learned or generated <coughs> the keys and the Diffie-Hellman, um, I'm sorry, the double ratchet initialization is complete. So, bam. what is needed for double ratchet in OpenPGP? I think first we need uh, per device keys or a robust synchronization mechani mechanism that can support synchronization on a per message basis if we want to implement the double ratchet with, uh, with sharing keys, which I don't think it's, is a good idea. We need two new packets for the initialization and then for the um, encrypting the session keys. And then in kind of a paradigm shift, we need to keep a lot of state in OpenPGP implementations. And this is going to be a hard sell, I guess. So I think the double ratchet algorithm which also, by the way, provides backward security. Um, it's a nice thing to aim at, but let's go for the first simple solution. First. All right, that was my talk. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh. So because it was asked already, let's talk about um, what to do with uh, past messages. Um, there are two solutions. Either um, we store the decrypted session keys, and we have a kind of mapping from the encrypted session keys to the decrypted ones. And in Sequoia, we want to do that anyway for speed, mainly because the um, asymmetric decryption operation could involve a smart card or kind of a remote key, and that could be slow. So along with the private keys, we want to store this mapping of session keys from encrypted ones to decrypted ones. And then this obviously had, has the downside that if that session, uh, store, session key store is compromised, then you know your messages are readable by the NSA. 
And we need some kind of interface to, to deal with uh, the deletion of messages. If a message is deleted, then we might want to purge the decrypted session key from our store. And this is what's called deletability. But it's a nice property. But even, even if we don't do that, right, it's not worse than what we have now. And for new devices, if we want to be able to read past messages on new, on new devices, we can add synchronization at setup time, synchronize the store somehow. So the other option is to replace the PKESK packet or add a, add a new one and re-encrypt the session key with the long-term key. That has downsides too. If it's synchronized away on an IMAP server or something like that, then you lose kind of the uh, nice property of forward secrecy. All right, more questions? Dominic. Like a very basic question. Yeah. Do people really delete OP mails? Yes. Some do, yes. <laughs> Please raise your hand if you have deleted all emails. So we are doing a survey whether or not people yes. delete emails. Old emails, and like a third of yeah. the people in the room have done so. <laughs> So I would be really interested in a study, yeah. So Dominic is interested in study? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, let, let's say in, in Sigma you can, you can enable this uh, automatic deletion of, like, I don't know, well, messages um, over than one minute or something. And that's actually what people do. Right. But if you don't have such a feature, I, I'm concerned nobody deletes all emails and then the whole thing. So you could imagine having that kind of feature in Delta Chat, conceivably. But there are also legal um, requirements. For example, businesses cannot just delete messages and right. so on. You know, they have to store for whatever ten years or so. Right. Also. It's also needs to be taken into consideration. It also affects encryption, of course. Right. Yeah. Total. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.